Hey everyone, so um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Abigail Person, uh, who is an associate professor and co-director of the neuroscience program at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, she's an expert in understanding the computations in the cerebellum and its role in smooth and precise movement. Um, Dr. Person has been awarded the Bocha Foundation Web Warring Biomedical Research Award and the Esther A. and Joseph Klingenstein Fund Award in the Neurosciences. Um, please welcome, please welcome her. All right. Well, it's a delight to be here, um, seeing heroes of the field in every direction. Um, and so I, wa I really want to thank you and Nita for the invitation. It means a lot. So with that, um, I heard that MIT is not a place um, for, um, for compliments. And so I'm going to start with an image of Mount Harvard, not, not to create like a crosstown rivalry or anything, but just <laughs> to kind of you know, introduce you to my home state. I've been giving a lot of Zoom talks. And since I don't go there, I bring myself to other people. But this hasn't yet changed. So. I present to you Mount Harvard. Now, the reason I'm showing you this isn't really just because I'm from Colorado, but because if we were to gaze up onto one of these um, snow fields, we might see a creature like this. This mountain goat is, um, in fact, demonstrating um, a kind of precise action which really motivates many of the questions in my lab. So you can see that it's really reaching for its next foothold here, not unlike this uh, now famous climber, Alex Honnold, who's reaching for his next handhold on his certifiably insane, ropeless ascent of El Capitan in California. So I hope you can appreciate that the precision of movement is a life or death scenario for these creatures. Um, one imprecise movement could lead to the death of these animals. And, um, and so we're very interested in how the brain actually mediates these kinds of behaviors. Now, it turns out that Alex Honnold has actually had his brain scanned. And there's something wrong, evidently, with his amygdala. But, I would argue that there's absolutely nothing wrong with his cerebellum. <laughs> and the reason that I can make that speculation is that we've known for over 100 years, really starting with the work of um, a British physician named uh, Gordon Holmes, who studied World War I uh, veterans who, ha who suffered um, fairly localized cerebellar lesions, to um, this man, who has a unilateral cerebellar lesion, that the cerebellum is critical for um, uh, precise reaching movements. So I'm going to show you this, this movie. This man's going to reach to his nose with his unaffected limb. And then he's going to reach to his nose with his affected limb. And you'll easily see um, the kind of motor deficit that characterizes cerebellar damage. So that's the good nose, or that's the good arm. And this is the bad arm. So with the good arm, he precisely uh, slows to touch his nose. With the bad arm, he oscillates right around that endpoint. So these oscillations, which I'll show you one more time, have um, resonance with all kinds of control theory that I think many uh, engineers are very familiar with, with control systems. So the problem is that when sensory feedback is delayed relative to the output of the system, that there's naturally oscillations that emerge. So the way I often describe this with reaching movements is if you were to uh, merely use your visual system to reach for a particular glass of water or something, the visual information would be way out of date by the time your fast uh, reach brought your limb to that target. And you'd overshoot the target. Then you would overcorrect and you would overshoot. And so that's essentially what people hypothesize these oscillations around endpoints are in patients with cerebellar damage. And so it suggests that the cerebellum may be computing some kind of anticipatory control that, that sort of obviates this problem in the nervous system, this slow sensory feedback problem. So this is kind of the working framework that we have in the lab, is that the cerebellum may be generating some kind of anticipatory control. And there's a lot of work that tries to map the um, sort of nature of information that enters the cerebellum through the mossy fibers um, into the cerebellum that sort of takes two flavors, either sensory information or motor information. This um, ends up uh, providing a very rich uh, spatiotemporal context for every movement that's represented in the granule cell layer which then projects into the Purkinje cell layer um, 
The Purkinje neurons are the sort of learning workhorses of the cerebellum, and it, there are many theories about what they compute. I'm going to sort of skip over all of the debate and just call it an internal model. It's some kind of representation of the body that's localized to whatever sort of effector we're talking about. Those Purkinje neurons are inhibitory projection neurons. They um, project down to the um, output structures of the cerebellum, which are the cerebellar nuclei. The cerebellar nuclei then distribute the output computation of the cerebellum to many different areas, and that is sort of modular depending on what cerebellar nucleus we're talking about along this medial to lateral uh, dimension. Okay. So this is this theory that we have that, um, that we get to work with. But when we started the lab, the evidence for any kind of feed-forward control coming out of the cerebellum was very marginal. Um, and so we wanted to know where do we look for uh, uh, evidence of, of feed-forward anticipatory control. Well, we really relied on um, data sets that had been generated over the years, investigating limb movements in a variety of creatures, including cats, monkeys, and mice. And um, several papers, including um, uh, work from Claude Getz's lab, as well as work from um, Albert Chen's lab, identified a particular um, output structure, the anterior interposed nucleus, as being um, critical for limb movements. Um, so they would use either mucimol inactivation or uh, genetic lesions of output neurons and found that those kinds of inactivation schemes recapitulated the, um, the phenomenon of dysmetria. And so this gave us a place to look, but no, by no means really isolated a anticipatory control um, signature because these long-term inactivations don't distinguish between problems in motor planning or or identify control policies. And so that's really where we began um, when we wanted to sort of interrogate this idea. So the first work I'm going to show you is all work um, from a fantastic graduate student in the lab, Matt Becker. He combined uh, real-time um, three-dimensional uh, limb tracking with um, electrophysiology and optogenetics to address this question of what does the interposed nucleus do um, to control reaching movements. And so he um, used a motion capture uh, system um, so that we could essentially get real-time um, readout of movement kinematics. And we use a mouse model um, for, for many of the obvious reasons. Um, and it's nice because the, these reaching movements are fairly discrete, um, so we can look at many of them. Mice will readily engage in this task, and we had this place to look for some kind of uh, cerebellar control. So the first observation we made using um, electrophysiological recordings from the interposed nucleus is that neurons in the interposed nucleus are modulated during reach. So you can see an example neuron here, where here we've aligned um, neural activity to the reach onset. And you can see that the, the cells are modulated. However, this modulation is really rather sloppy from trial to trial, as I, I think you can appreciate. However, if we simply align the um, neural data to the endpoint of reaches, we find that the neural activity is, in fact, much uh, more sharply uh, regulated. And so this was interesting to us because, as you might recall from the video, it's movement endpoints that seem to be preferentially disturbed in patients with cerebellar damage. Indeed, we saw this kind of endpoint um, modulation in many neurons within the interposed nucleus by no by no means all of the neurons, but many of these cells show this kind of um, uh, endpoint uh, uh, related activity, um, which you can see sort of happens right during this decelerative phase of the reaching movement. And so the natural question that we asked is, is this activity causal for um, uh, limb control? So to address this question, we, we introduced um, channel rhodopsin into the output neurons of the, of the cerebellar nuclei within the anterior interposed nucleus. Um, implant an optical fiber over into A, and then used closed loop optogenetic stimulation just during reach on randomized 25% of reaches and asked what's the kinematic consequence of this, uh, of this perturbation. So um, this is a short stimulus. You'll see it uh, displayed up in the top, and it's illustrated here as well. So here's a mouse. It gets stimulated, doesn't get the pellet. Sometimes they don't get the pellet, however. So, um, Let's look at many reaches. So this illustration shows um, unstimulated reaches in orange and stimulated reaches in blue. 
the point of the 50 millisecond stimulation uh, stimulus train is shown here. And then I pulled out stills from this movie down here. And so what you can see is early in the reach, these reaches are um, indistinguishable as you would expect. But right after the stimulation, you can see that the stimulated reaches are not as far out and they're not as far up. Um, and then there's only a late phase correction. Um, and so if we looked at, at these reaches in um, sort of outward velocity space, we'd find that um, the, the uh, outward velocity slows rapidly um, in response to stimulation, okay? And the upshot here is that these reaches end up hypometric. So the mouse is not reaching as far in response to this stimulation. Um, so I am going to skip a bunch of data, but we can, we can show that modulating the strength of optogenetic stimulation modulates the strength of the kinematic effect, um, and that we can deliver this uh, stimulation at any point in reach and always see this reduction in outward velocity. So the obvious th question then, if we want to interpret the activity that we observed in the interposed nucleus as causal for deceleration, is that we should be able to, to reduce activity in that structure and see the opposite effect. And so we did this experiment where we, we introduced ARCH into uh, the interposed nucleus. And what we found is indeed um, a consistent increase in all nine animals that we tested this in, in the outward velocity. So here we're, we're sort of um, under some biomechanical constraints of the, the sort of length of the limb. But we see this very consistent um, increase in uh, outward velocity during the um, ARCH inactivation of the nucleus. And, uh, and concomitant overshooting of the, of the reach endpoint. So these data summarized give us this idea that this activity in the interposed nucleus acts as some kind of a velocity dial to uh, regulate limb kinematics. Um, but there are a lot of potential interpretations of these data. Um, so, for example, we know that um, activity from the motor cortex is critical for driving these movements. This is in my uh, beautiful work done by Adam Hampman's group, um, where they've inactivated uh, motor cortex during reach, and that halts the movement entirely. So what is this um, structure, the cerebellum, doing to these putative commands from motor cortex? So our data are consistent with at least two models. Um, the first is that maybe this activity from cerebellum is acting like something like a brake or a gain controller. So if you imagine some sort of um, un unfettered command from cortex generating a movement with a particular outward and upward velocity, and then we stimulate uh, the cerebellum and that's reduced. So that's one possibility. An equally tenable possibility is that there's some kind of a directional command that's in the opposite direction um, that is being added to this control signal from motor cortex. So these two, um, these two possibilities are interesting because they make distinguishable hypotheses about what should happen if we stimulate on return um, of the movement. So if we stimulate re on return and we are activating or reducing the gain of that, that, uh, that command or we're just breaking the limb, then we should show that the um, limb will slow down uh, in response to that stimulation. Alternatively, if we're at introducing sort of a, a return uh, vector of command, we should actually speed the limb up if we stimulate on return. So we perform this experiment, and our data are consistent with this model, um, because when we stimulate, um, in the negative velocity domain, we find that the limb actually goes faster in the return direction. So these data are, um, support the view that there is some kind of a summation of directional uh, control vectors um, that are mediating the uh, limb movements um, in, this, in this paradigm. So, we wanted to return to the neural data and ask a little bit of a deeper question about refinement of movement by the cerebellum. So um, we sorted reaches by the um, firing rates that were issued by the interposed nucleus during a particular um, reach um, and separated those into deciles, which are color coded here. So the reaches um, that had the highest firing rate, not surprisingly what I've already shown you, decelerated the fastest, and those with the lowest firing rates decelerated the slowest. And this is also consistent with other um, uh, uh, linear correlation analyses that we did. But why should we expect trial by trial variability in the firing rates to happen at all? 
So to address this, we went back in time from the um, epoch that we're analyzing for firing rates here and looked at the peak velocity of the reaches. And we found that um, reaches that decelerated the fastest and had the highest firing rates also had the highest peak velocities. And reaches that decelerated the slowest um, and had the lowest uh, uh, firing rates also had the lowest peak velocities. OK, so this gets a little bit wobbly. So, but the upshot is, if that, is that the endpoints, regardless of this initial kinematic variability, were stable. So the, if the animal reached slowly, and it would decelerate slowly, and it would end on target. And if it reached very fast, it would decelerate very quickly and end on target. And so the model that we propose is that this activity that's regulated on a reach-by-reach -reach basis in the interposed nucleus is um, accommodating a deceleration that allows the limb to end on target. And we can illustrate that if you did not have this kind of scaled activity from the interpose, that reaches that started out very slow and had an average rate of deceleration would end hypometric. So they would slow down essentially too fast for a particular uh, end point. Conversely, um, reaches that start out very fast and do not decelerate fast enough would end up hypermetric with an average deceleration profile. So by regulating this late phase kinematic feature, the cerebellum may improve the precision of, of movements. So that's kind of the model that we had going, where we have this kind of peak velocity that scales activity in the interposed nucleus to regulate the uh, decelerative phase of the reaching movement. And so the next question that we, that we um, uh, wanted to address is how this computation might actually be made. Um, and so to, to address this, we, we um, made the very not controversial decision to look at the Purkinje neurons, which are, the, of course, the major driver to the interposed nucleus. Um, and so uh, another very talented student in the lab, Dylan Callum, um, ended up targeting um, his neural recordings to a, a part of the cerebellar cortex that had previously been identified by Tom Otis's lab as, as controlling or at least influencing forelimb movements in mice. Um, and so indeed, when he um, uh, recorded in this region, he found many Purkinje neurons um, that modulate their activity around the time of reach. And so he could look at entire populations of these cells and find that um, you know, there were cells that increased their firing rate around the time of reach and cells that decreased their firing rate around the reach. I should say that these are all high firing rate cells. Many of them have complex spikes, um, and that's how we're ident or identifying them as Purkinje cells. So if we look at population PSTHs of these two populations, these increasers and decreasers, if you will, we find that they're um, practically mirror images of the two. Um, and for a very long time, we were spending a lot of time doing all kinds of sophisticated regression techniques to try to understand what are these individual neurons encoding, what are the kinematic features of their code. And I can bore you with bar graphs that are you know, 18 parameters long. And, um, and so I was, we were just boring ourselves with all of this data. And Reza Shadmer came and visited. And he has been um, uh, at the forefront of thinking about um, populations of Purkinje neurons sort of conspiring to um, generate comprehensive codes at the population level. And he said, well, why don't you just see what they're all doing if you, you know, mix them up? And so we did. We, we combined all of these neural recordings together. And what we found was really remarkable given what we had observed in the interposed nucleus, which, to remind you, was a linear scaling of the increase in activity with the magnitude of the decrease. And it, it scaled with uh, peak velocity. So what we observed in the Purkinje neurons, which are here sorted by peak velocity, is that there was a net decrease in the activity of the population of Purkinje neurons that also uh, scaled in magnitude relative to peak velocity. So the largest pauses were happening with the very fastest reaches. And it, um, it sort of scales linearly. So if we, if we sort of match that that uh, magnitude of a, um, of a pause, if you will, onto the um, scaled activity of the interposed nucleus, it um, 
uh, stands to reason that this uh, disinhibition may, um, may sort of regulate the amplitude of the activity that's coming out of the interposed nucleus. Okay, so that was a lot, but I, I hope that, that, that you followed all that. So I showed you now what Purkinje neurons are doing, but I, I, I started this section with this question of how this computation might be made. Um, and so I need to kind of take a little detour into teaching you a little bit more about cerebellar theory in order to get here. And before I do that, I want to point out two temporal relationships that emerge from uh, these data. The first is that the, the um, max outward acceleration, peak velocity, those are parameters in kinematic space that happen before deceleration, okay? That's kind of obvious. The, um, the uh, reach kinematics have a bell-shaped profile, so they, you know, accelerate, then decelerate to endpoint. Um, but also, in patients with cerebellar damage, the timing of agonist and breaking antagonist muscles that's seen in healthy patients is delayed in, in, in cerebellar patients. So there's, there's some kind of a this and then that relationship that emerges in coordinated movements. And so we hypothesize that this peak velocity is serving as something of a contextual cue um, to the cerebellum to as then regulate the amplitude of deceleration by the structure. And so to expand on this idea that there's an association between a this and then that, we're going to take a left turn. I'm going to remind people about cerebellar associative learning, and then we're going to get back to reaching. So many people in their sort of introductory neuroscience classes will learn about delay eyelid conditioning in cerebellum, at which point they'll fall asleep, and then they'll wake up again when people are talking about cognition. But I'm going to beg for your attention here. Um, so in delay eyelid conditioning, classic Pavlovian sorts of uh, pairings, there's a neutral condition stimulus. In this case, it's a tone. The tone is played for several hundred milliseconds, and at the very end of the tone, at, puff is delivered, an air puff is delivered to the eye. This is an aversive stimulus that causes a reflexive eye blink uh, in, in naive animals. After repeated pairings of the tone and the puff, the tone and the puff, the tone and the puff, the animal learns to close its eyelid just before the puff is about to come, okay? So you can see that there's this learned uh, component to anticipating the time of the, of the air puff. Now, one critical piece of this associative learning is that there's a time component to it. So the animal does not close its eye at the beginning of the tone. It closes its eyelid right before the puff is going to happen. And so uh, neuroscientists like Mike Mock and Dean Bonamano have thought deeply about how it is that this timing can be learned. I should also add that uh, decades of work show that this, um, this task requ was required um, requires the cerebellum. So we think this is actually happening within the cerebellum. But the basic upshot is that the mossy fiber inputs to the cerebellum carry this tone activity, and that granule cells break that invariant tone activity up into what is called a temporal basis set. So there's sort of chunks of time that are represented by small populations of granule cells. Each one of those uh, populations converges onto a Purkinje neuron, which under the naive condition isn't doing anything except inhibiting the nuclei, and so there's no behavior. So what happens in the, in the presence of a um, puff of air is that there is activity um, that is uh, generated in what is called the inferior olive, which is a teaching signal to the cerebellum. Details elided. The point is, is that when this teaching signal happens, there is a concomitant change in the strength of uh, granule cell inputs to Purkinje neurons, but only in the cells that were active right before the puff, okay? So this is how time might then be sort of uh, associated um, with an aversive event. That, that redu reduction in synaptic strength leads to pauses in Purkinje cells and concomitant disinhibition of the cerebellar nuclei, and then that leads to the conditioned response. So we hypothesize that this activity that we see during reaching movements in the interposed nucleus is akin to a conditioned response. That is, it's responding to some sort of initial cue. What does this have to do with reach adaptation, right? So I showed you these, uh, these velocity traces of the reaching movement, this bell-shaped velocity profile. 
And so we would argue that, let's say that there, this is going to be a bad reach. It's going to overshoot its target. So we have uh, this, uh, these, this initial kinematic information coming into the cerebellum through the mossy fiber pathway. If it overshoots its target, maybe there's a complex spike. That complex spike then is going to go to the Purkinje neurons, change the synaptic weights of the granule cells that were active during um, that sort of peak velocity phase. Then when this um, reach happens again, um, the, same peak or the same peak velocity may be reached, but because of this um, associative plasticity, we think that there may be um, an increase in the activity of the nuclear neurons to sort of drive uh, reach slowing, to increase the rate of deceleration and land on target. So that's our working hypothesis. How on earth do we test any of this? So one of the tricks of the delay eyelid conditioning field is to substitute um, the condition stimulus with electrical or optogenetic stimulation of mossy fiber pathway directly. So this way you get, you get a round of all the other stuff going on in the brain and you just introduce the stimulus here. Um, and you can fictively associate those things in, in rabbits. We don't have that luxury because we're, we're looking at this naturalistic movement. But we borrowed a, a sort of trick from them. And so instead of um, uh, perturbing a reach through some sort of external means, we're going to perturb a reach through activation of the mossy fiber pathways themselves. So we're essentially superimposing some kind of novel contextual input into the, into the uh, circuit. And so to do this, we introduced uh, channel rhodopsin into the pontine nucleus um, of, the, of the mouse, which expresses then channel rhodopsin in the mossy fibers very densely. We can then implant an optical fiber and then perform an experiment that's conceptually similar to the ones I showed you in the interposed nucleus, where we stimulate in closed loop with the movement. Okay. Um, in this case, we're, um, we're stimulating um, slightly differently because we're going to do this in a block format. So rather than stimulating in randomized uh, ways, we're going to stimulate such that the animal can actually hope to learn that every reach against this perturbation. So also work from Adams Ham Hammond's lab had shown that stimulation of the pontine fibers can perturb the reach. So we had good reason to think that there might be some kind of a, a learnable contingency here. So indeed, um, we found that optogenetic activation of the pontine afferents caused um, overshoot of the reaching movement. Um, however, if we continuously deliver that stimulus, um, the uh, effect of that stimulus actually adapts. So there's less of a, of a uh, kinematic effect late in the stimulus block compared to early. And when we turn off the stimulus, we see that there's this um, opposite overshoot. This is classic hallmark of cerebellar adaptation. So this is cool. Now we've got an adaptation paradigm that we can use to explore this, this idea that readapts. So we saw that in, in all animals that we've tested. We know that activation of these, cell, uh, of these afferents actually causes changes in Purkinje cells, but what happens during that within session adaptation? So to address this, we've now recorded from Purkinje neurons during adaptation. Um, uh, skipping over some details, neurons, well, I, I don't have to. I, sometimes neurons are activated by this stimulus and other neurons are inhibited, sort of similar to that kind of balance of uh, bursters and pausers that I showed you about earlier. And so we grouped cells, either they were activated by stimulation or inactivated by stimulation, and watched how that uh, progressed through the course of adaptation. And what we found is that um, neurons that uh, showed an activation to, um, in response to optogenetic stimulation or inactivation in response, um, slowly decay um, back to essentially baseline. So if we look at uh, p-value uh, maps, um, we find that there's a very high difference between the stimulated and control uh, uh, profiles of Purkinje neurons early in the stimulation block, and that decays with, uh, with multiple trials over the course of the block. And so this is very cool. This is within, within session adaptation. Um, and it brings us uh, to a question of like, how is, this, how is this happening? So I'm not going to go 
uh, into much of the details of this model, but we hypothesize um, a, a sort of a consistent with the, the Mock and Buonamato uh, work that there is a time varying population of, of granule cells active during the reach, and that our optogenetic perturbation is driving activity within this population, which um, is then uh, sort of decaying back to its target uh, zone during, um, during adaptation. So it's interesting if we, if we look at which synapses are actually undergoing change during this, this adaptation block, we find that, of course, the, the, the um, granule cells that we're driving with our optogenetics, they're changing, so their weights are decayed. But what's important to note is that neurons that we are not explicitly uh, driving are also changing, but in this way that's temporally locked to the stimulus. And we think that this um, sort of um, uh, application of, at, of uh, plasticity to neurons that weren't causing the problem, but were sort of just coincidentally active during the perturbation is essential for the emergence of after effects. Um, uh, that are considered to be the hallmark of learning. But we consider them to be evidence that there's a misattribution of error to the coincidentally active cells. So I'll end there um, to summarize that we think that we have at least the beginnings of a, um, of a model for feed-forward control um, during a volitional movement uh, in the cerebellum, and that um, through our experiments, we have an idea that there may be a conditioned response in the nucleus that's structuring precision of endpoint that may be learned by the population activity in Purkinje cells, um, and that that is sort of temporally produced through what we think is ha happening as a, as a basis set is forming in response to naturalistic inputs, which I didn't get into. So I want to thank uh, the very wonderful people I get to work with, Matt Becker and Dylan Callum, most notably for this talk. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. So I realize it went fast. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for the great talk. Uh, we have a few minutes for audience questions. Thank you, Abby. I really enjoyed that talk. Um, any, this is just a detailed question. Any idea what mechanism is responsible for sort of staggering the delays of these cells? Yeah, yeah, we have a, a lot of ideas about that, actually. So, um, so I actually have a figure from a um, manuscript that... Um, that uh, is on bioarchive now that is explicitly about this topic. topic. How, does a base, how would a temporal basis set form in the granule cell layer? Um, so this idea has, has stumped the, um, the people that are studying the, the delay island conditioning because what they have is an invariant signal coming in. And so they hypothesize that there's recurrent and apician and there's all these kinds of specialized mechanisms in the granule cell layer itself. So, my, my student, Jesse Gilmer, whose work I didn't talk about, he was building some models, and he showed this one figure, and it had this basis set, and I was like, where did that come from? He's like, oh, I just put in some, you know, naturalistic inputs. And so this, this was surprising, because I don't think that the people studying the naturalistic movements had really engaged with the timing problem. But it turns out, if you have time-varying inputs in the mossy fibers, which we model as um, ornstein uhlenbeck functions that have an autocorrelation time of about 100 milliseconds, sort of similar to the activity of mossy fiber afferents. If you put that structure of, of input into a very simple model of a summation circuit in the granule cell layer, where each granule cell receives four of these, these sort of noisy inputs, that this basis set is just an emergent property. It's actually very trivial for the granule cell layer to generate this. It requires a level of inhibition that can, that can uh, float with this, but that's very consistent with the interneuron network of Golgi cells in the cerebellar cortex. So we think this is a highly likely thing to happen. In electric fish. That's right. So they, they have, um, uh, so in the Kennedy paper from, um, in Ann Kennedy's paper from Nate Sawtell's lab, they have this nice um, basis set that they've observed in uh, fish granule cells, which is probably the clearest 
basis set that anyone has in a granule cell layer in a cerebellar-like structure. So with their, um, their uh, at least when I've talked to Nate, I think that they think that there's a, because those um, electric or organ discharges are quite pulsatile, um, they think that there's a special uh, neuron called a unipolar brush cell that's sort of extending the duration of that pulsatile length signal, which we think is slightly different than this kind of continuous um, motor signal that might be motor and sensory sort of reafferent signal that would be coming into the cerebellum through the mossy fibers. Um, but it's a very, it's a very good point. Um, so, right. Um, we talked about it with the postdocs and students earlier today about how the, there's really a dearth of um, uh, population recordings in granule cells um, at the millisecond time scales that are really needed to interrogate this idea. So, yeah. Um, so I have a question. So we actually had a journal club <laughs> on, on a few of your papers. And one of the questions that came up was um, some of these co principles of computations that you see for movement in the cerebellum, how do you think they may generalize to sort of cognitive computations um, that happen in the cerebellum but may not necessarily be related to movement? Yeah, it's such a good question. It's really the question of the hour. And I think with Xiaojing's talk, the, the, um, the idea, I think, would be that there's sort of um, an expansion of prefrontal cortices along with the actual anterior, uh, actually posterior and lateral uh, components of the cerebellum. Um, and those have evolutionarily grown together and so I think it's a very fair question, and I, I can only wildly speculate, and it's probably completely wrong, but may, we know that there's some heterogeneity in the um, circuit uh, elements that are seen in the granule cell layer in different lobules. So for example, I brought up these unipolar brush cells that, that um, uh, Nate Sautel has, has uh, um, sort of speculate about, those are found very densely in vestibular components. And I don't know whether they're seen in the um, more uh, sort of uh, posterior lateral section segments, but you might expect that time constants of autocorrelation are getting longer and longer, and that if the plasticity mechanisms in cerebellum can keep up, I think there's an eligibility trace question, and maybe Jeff can sort of <laughs> enlighten us here, but. But you know, if if the if the reverberation throughout the brain is robust enough to consistently reactivate the same kinds of cells in the same cells, um, then maybe there can be a, essentially an, the same algorithm about error and and uh, association of um, sort of predictors to that. Um, that happens in the motor regions just at longer time scales. So I think it's all about time scales. It's all about can you get a longer basis set? Are the eligibility traces for the plasticity that's required for change uh, sufficient for, for this? Um, so I don't know. That's, that's kind of him. We can be probably not very satisfying. But yeah, it's a great, it's a very interesting set of questions. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience? Um, I can ask one more sort of high-level question. So at mm -hmm. ICON, a lot of us are thinking about, you know, how to um, adapt the existing theories in various domains to capture more and more complex behavior. So in, and it's becoming in increasingly possible to sort of measure more accurately complex behavior in movement, like higher degree of freedom movements in animals and movement across longer time scales in naturalistic environments. So in what ways do you think sort of these theories and principles, say in the cerebellum, um, would need to be adapted, or would it just be more of the same when you're trying to explain complex behavior, or would they need to fundamentally change to explain sort of more complex behavior? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think fundamentally you have to have sharp questions. Other, otherwise, you're lost, right? So I, I think that um, we can talk about more complex behavior, but what, what about more complex behavior are we talking about, right? Is it, it the complexity itself? Is it you know, something else? Um, already, our behavior is considered absurdly complex. So you know, different audiences are like, oh my god, unconstrained reaching? Are you 
kidding me, right? So, I mean, people that study motor control want a two, you know, a planar two-arm robot. That's it, you know? So, I think that we're making track, I think we have some traction on this behavior and it's already complex. And I think that people can make headway on much more complex tasks if, they're, if their questions are clear. It's just a matter of like, what, are you, what do you want to know, right? So. Thanks. Mm -hmm.